In a new age world filled with delusions and wish fulfillment by morons in need of attention, renowned experiencers of high strangeness and podcasters Jeffrey Ritzman and Jeremy Vaney received invitations to a tropical paradise getaway called Paratopia. Little did they know, it was the same type of new age spiritual retreat they've been avoiding all their lives. Paratopia, we've been wanting to do an episode on the Kogi for quite some time. If you'll recall uh, me mentioning the Kogi tribe uh, several times throughout 2009, well, we finally have Barbara Three Crow, who is quite qualified to speak about them because um, she's been going to Colombia and the Sierra Nevadas and uh, helping them with their sacred ceremonies. Barbara is a longtime student of the late Lakota medicine man Wallace Black Elk. She is author of Mending the Sacred Hoop. Her latest book is Return of the Sacred Feminine in Teachings of the Grandmothers. And she is here to teach us. But do we dare to learn? Well, you can learn all about Barbara Three Crow by going to www.barbara3crow.com. Three is spelled out, T-H-R-E-E, Barbara Three Crow dot com. And she'll be uh, learning us real good right after this brief message. Hey guys and gals, it's Jeff here with a message about Mark Nesbitt's Supernatural Summit, February 19th through the 21st, 2010. This is unlike any paranormal conference you've ever been to. In fact, one of the reasons it's so innovative is that you never leave your home. You attend this online. This is a virtual conference. You can be anywhere in the world with net access and from a home PC, a laptop, right down to a cell phone, you can attend this gig. You can ask questions live to the presenters, interact with different exhibitors. Every aspect of an in-person conference is there. This is over 50 hours of presentations and interactions with paranormal investigators, authors, and exhibitors right down to your fellow attendees without the travel cost or hotel expenses. One of the best parts, after this whole thing is over, you've got four weeks to watch recordings of the lectures you may have missed during the live event. You're not going to miss anything but the hotel bills, the travel nonsense, and of course your missed work time. There's also exhibitor booths where you can shop from home for books, DVDs, and even investigation equipment. So you're not even missing the, the tables you'd normally see at a conference. Some of the presenters, some of the best out there. Rosemary Ellen Guiley, Scott Crownover, Lane Crosby, Dr. Charles Emmons, Rob Conover, John Zappas, and even the dear friend of this show, Mr. Mark Nesbitt. And that's just some of the great presenters you'll be able to hear and interact with. Now, here's the deal for our listeners. You're saying, what's this cost? Well, the cost, if you mention Paratopia and register before February 15th, the cost is $50. That's $25 off the regular mission for the whole conference. Now, in addition to the discount, Mark's decided to do something even more special for our Paratopia listeners. Again, go to www.supernaturalsummit.com. Mention Paratopia when you register. You'll not only get the discount, but in addition to that, you'll be automatically entered for a drawing to win a night's investigation with Mark Nesbitt and me, Jeff Ritzman from Paratopia. So guys, head on over right now, www.supernaturalsummit.com. Get registered. Again, the date for this is the 19th of February through the 21st of February. Go check it out, www.supernaturalsummit.com. So without further ado, Paratopia, please welcome... Barbara Three Crow. Barbara, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, yeah. Now, we had spoken uh, privately about talking about the Kogi first and then maybe getting into your background, but I think we probably need to know who you are first, and then that'll lead into how exactly you came to know the Kogi, uh, and then we'll talk about the Kogi if, if that works for you. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um 
I can start with, um, I've lived in the Hudson Valley all of my life. I was born here um, in the uh, capital of the UFO connection, you might say. I guess it's known as that. And um, I've had a lot of my own very uh, unusual and experiences. I don't know if you would call them paranormal um, or because I, I kind of... Um, felt very strongly that these were something very important um, and have grown to know that and understand that. So I guess the, that word paranormal, to me, to me, these experiences were quite normal. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a household uh, where my grandmother talked to me about the little people and they levitated tables to call in the spirits. So I had a lot of those kinds of experiences, and from very early on, I had some contact experience, um, a lot of time outside in nature, experiencing the little people and uh, various other phenomenon. So it was really a part of my world, very normal, although I did uh, learn very early on to not talk to many people about these things. I found that people were um, very nervous or they didn't understand it. Uh, some of my experiences were pretty powerful, and um, I would say they run the gamut of beings uh, appearing out of body, uh, being touched by spirits, hearing um, what they say, uh, a spirit speaking to me or spirit speaking to me, um, visions, visionary experiences. Um, catastrophic events, you know, it runs the whole gamut. Mm -hmm. So all of these things I sort of um, were in my realm from very early on. And um, as I became an adult, I tried to live a normal life, although these experiences were still present. And uh, I know you and I have talked about um, the phenomenon of uh, star children or um, those returning here during this period of time as star children. Some people call them, uh, I guess, the, the crystal children or indigo children. And when I was young, I was told that by these beings that I would, uh, that I would meet many others as I um, became an adult, which has happened. So at about 20 years ago, um, I had a very profound experience. Um, where I, um, I was told by guidance or these guides or beings that I was going to be diagnosed with breast cancer. And that, in fact, happened. And during that time, I, was, um, I had a, a vision and was guided to go into the mountains near here. Um, I live near the Catskills, and I was guided to go to a place called Manitou. Uh, it was called Manitou by indigenous peoples who, who had lived here. And the Manitou means place where the spirits live or spirits dwell. And um, during that time, I went there and I spent several hours in the mountains. And uh, I was guided towards this fall of uh, a, a rock fall. It fell off of a cliff. Uh, a very large uh, group of stones had fallen loose. And as I went towards this, I found at the edge of this group of stones a very unusual stone. And I was guided to take that stone and proceeded home with it where I continued to have a, a very unusual experience where I felt myself being taken somewhere and I heard chanting and, and I felt that I was um, experiencing something very ancient. I didn't understand it. But when I was finished, I had this sense of very deep peace. And I knew in some, some way, I knew somehow that I had been healed. And when that happened, um, I was asked by these beings to begin to um, gather um, women into circle, to begin teaching them. Now, this was something I was not at all involved in in my life. I was living what you might say an ordinary life. I was, you know, I was in a relationship, uh, with children, I had a business. 
So I was not anywhere near any of this kind of stuff uh, that you might say um, spiritual, you know, spiritual teachings or Mm -hmm. anything along that line. So I was very frightened and reluctant to do that. I didn't understand what this was about, but I couldn't refuse in a way uh, because of what had happened. And I was then told about a prophecy um, that would have to do with the coming times, the earth changes, and that was about the return of the sacred feminine, which in a way means uh, harmony, returning to harmony and balance between the male and the female, the sacred masculine and the sacred feminine. So that was about 20 years ago, and that led me on a very uh, incredible spiritual journey all these years, which led me to Colombia, South America, where I, um, two years ago, began to meet uh, the Kogi. And this past August, I was also invited to another gathering in Colombia, where I again met um, more of the Kogi, as well as three of the other uh, elders from the other Pueblos. There's four Pueblos in the Sierra Nevadas in Colombia. Mm-hmm. The Kogi are pretty much most known by people uh, because um, they were the ones that um, came out of hiding in, in, I guess it was about 1990, and exposed themselves to the world after being hidden for centuries. When, when the Spanish came, they fled into the Sierra Nevadas, and no one knew they existed. And these people have maintained uh, their law of origin, their ancient ways, all of those centuries. And so they exposed themselves because they became alarmed at what was happening to the earth. Uh, Where they live in the Sierra Nevadas, they call that the heart of the world. And um, so this this has been um, a step onto a whole other pathway for myself in well, relation to the elders there. Before we take that step, um, let's take one more step back, because you, you are also the keeper of the pipe, the peace pipe? Well, it's a sacred uh, pipe. It's a chinampa in the Lakota tradition. Yes, I am. And, and that happened um, because I met um, an elder, a Lakota medicine man, Wallace Black Elk, uh, 14 years ago. And uh, after being with him for several years, he instructed me to begin to carry the sacred Chinampa. And um, during a winter, I spent a whole winter preparing this. Together, he and I went to hunt for the tree. (laughs) We went on a spiritual journey to hunt for the ash tree. We offered tobacco and took its life in the traditional way. And I was gifted a piece of red pipe stone that you make the bowl from. And through the whole winter, I worked and prepared and prayed with that to to um, create this uh, sacred pipe for the people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what is your your background, your racial background? Well, I'm Irish and German and Nanticoke. Nanticoke on my mother's side through my grandmother's lineage. Mm-hmm. Now, she's the one who used to talk to me about the little people and... Um, various beings like that, and the one who used to call in the spirits. Were the little people the same as anything that we hear today in UFO literature? Well, you know, it's interesting about the little people, because when I met my teacher, Wallace Black Elk, and the more I speak to or get to know more indigenous people, I feel... um, very strongly, and I think this is probably true, that all indigenous peoples know of the little people, and they appear in different forms. Um, So, you know, uh, I think it's very common in their cultures, and of course it's common in other cultures too. European cultures had the the little people, the fairy people, you know, all of that, and I've come to believe that these are, are related to the star relatives, you know, that they are those kinds of beings as well. Uh, That's my own feeling, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, So is it common for someone who's not Lakota to carry the Lakota pipe? Well, uh, that's a controversy. (laughs) 
There are those uh, who believe that, uh, as a matter of fact, grandfather Wallace Black Elk had a vision given to him, as many others also have, is to share these sacred ways with all nations, all people. And uh, that is something that he actually did. He went all over the world um, praying with people and sharing these ways and and uh, helping them to understand. And, and for me, when I first came to a ceremony and where I first met him, um, Wallace Black Elk, the ceremony I went to was a traditional Lakota lodge or a nippy or purification lodge. Some people call it a sweat lodge. And I felt like I had come home. I felt that I had finally found what I had been searching for, and it touched me very deeply, and um, I could say that it basically saved my life. This kind of, this sacred way is something that is so profound for me. It's uh, it's an earth-based culture, of course. It's something that I've been related to all of my life, but yet the Catholic Church, which I was, I grew up Catholic, did not fulfill what I felt to be true. Uh, didn't satisfy this innate nature that I had, um, you know, the spiritual realm. But the Lakota tradition did, and that's why it was so um, significant for me to find that. Mm -hmm. So there is controversy about um, non-indigenous or non-full blood, let's say. The blood quantum is an issue in in a lot of traditions. And, um, And I know that there are people who are not walking in a good way. Um, even full blood people are doing harm, as well as non-native people. So that does cause a controversy. Okay, so that's all your background information. And now you end up uh, in contact with the Kogi, and you had told me privately that you felt you feel that sort of all of your life's work uh, was what preparation for this, bringing you, leading you to mm-hmm. this moment. Well, you know, it's interesting because we look through, we look back over our lives, we can see a thread that uh, relates to everything, and little did we know in a moment or in an experience that this was significant and that that it would lead us on to the next phase of our life and that it all links up, that it's all connected and everything, you know, you cross paths with people and uh, they've crossed paths with someone else and and before you know it, there's a common thread, and and you're drawn into different situations that are very significant. And, um, of course, some of these can be positives or negatives, but then again, they're all purposeful. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yes, I believe that um, because of my um, meeting Wallace Black Elk and the work that he brought me to do, the spiritual work that I'm involved in in the Lakota tradition, had brought me to be asked by a shaman in Colombia to go there to help the people to pray. And I also do other teachings, you know, earth-oriented teachings and living on the earth in a more sacred way and different healing. So I was asked to go there to teach and to also uh, help the people to pray in this way. And so that led me to Colombia, and there that's how that happened. Mm-hmm. So this is, you know... It's an odd show. I mean, we started off as a paranormal show, sort of strictly talking about our experiences and UFOs and that sort of thing, and then it went broader to be more encompassing of just consciousness, human consciousness, and right. trying to poke around in these various ways. So what what's important about the Kogi for us to know that will make sense to the context of this show? <laughs> I don't know if I even said that right, but... Yeah. Well, what's interesting... What I another point that I want to make about my own work and what I've been led to do 20 years ago about the works with women in relation to the prophecy of the return of the sacred feminine, that when I met the Kogi, I became, of course, um, more uh, knowledgeable. Not great, not a great deal, because there's so much. It's very complex. Their law of origins and their way of relating in the realms of um, spiritual realm and the relationship to the earth and all the elements is very complex. And I think that I would never completely ever understand um, because this is a very ancient way 
I mean, they say that they they were here when the gods lived on the earth, and that's how old their culture is. And of course, they um, they pretty much, as I said, sustained their law of origins and their culture because they were hidden from Western ways. They were very, you know, secluded. And the other um, people, uh, the other pueblos, the Wiwa, the Arhuaco, and the Concuarmo, were also, they were all originally um, people of the Terona. They were a very, um, they were a very sophisticated pre-Hispanic civilization. And when the Spaniards uh, came into their area uh, in the 16th century, they they all fled or they were destroyed. You know, their culture was destroyed and many of them were killed. But the Kogi specifically um, went off into the high Sierras and were never seen again. So they have all those centuries maintained this ancient way. It's pretty mind-boggling. Mm-hmm. Uh, their relationship and their abilities that we can only um, touch a very small part of. You know, I mean, we talk about leaving our bodies, or I mean, I've had some pretty, um, pretty out there experiences in my life. You know, going into the light, uh, having beings speak to me, being lifted out of my body, and so on and so forth, and communication with elementals and my own experiences. They've been quite profound, and um, yet it doesn't touch at all what these people are capable of. But one thing that really struck me, and it relates to the uh, prophecy I was given, is their um, feminine principles in relation to the sacred feminine. Um, That really um, came very strong to me. They said that they believe that the uh, Creator was the great sacred mother, uh, as one thing, and that she appears in different forms uh, according to her own creation. And this, some of these might seem familiar to people. And she has appeared, uh, you know, as the, um, as the spider, grandmother spider. And she's appeared as a serpent, a huge black serpent, or a, a large black bird. Um, so all of these things she manifests herself as and shows herself the, the, in this way. And she gave birth. Um, to all things, she thought everything into being, and uh, and they also in their whole life, in their the people, the men and the women, their whole culture, their law of origin is based on reciprocity between the male and the female. There's a balance, a fine balance that is held within their culture in relation to everything. Um, so even building a house, for instance, when they build their huts, there are female trees and male trees. So one side of the house will be have a feminine energy and the other side of the house will have a masculine energy. And this is very important to them because their whole life and their whole purpose, they say, is in relation to harmonizing the earth. All of the sacred works that they do is about that. That's They say that is why they are here. It's mm-hmm. sort of they call it their law of origins. I call it the original instructions. And the original instructions, I believe, that we all received original instructions. The black nation, red nation, yellow, and white nations. But we have forgotten those original instructions, although there are some remote, let's say remote indigenous people throughout the world who have still maintained them. I might say like the Hopi, for instance, there's... The, a group of the Hopi who have really, really worked very hard to um, keep out any any intrusions of Western ways, although they are still subjected to that, whereas the Kogi were not. And you might say, in um, we could look at the Tibetan people, for instance, the ones you know the, who are way you know remote and still doing their ceremonies and their spiritual works. You know, but the, even they are now, even they are subjected to to the outside world. Mm-hmm. And uh, and you might say that there are remote um, people in Africa, a very ancient people, um, who also may maintain some of their ancient uh, knowledge and their original instructions. But they also are now, everyone seems to be throughout the world, slowly losing these and being inundated with Western ways. So the Kogi, now that they've exposed themselves, are also experiencing this. 
Mm-hmm. We have kind of a diverse range of people who listen, and some um, are willing to listen um, with a really open mind, and some need something like concrete, logical, you know. Right. Um, and so for those people, I guess, could you explain how it is that the Kogi have become so, for lack of a better term, high-minded? Uh, they're, the way they meditate, the way they create their mamas, what a mama is, that whole process? Mm-hmm. Well, the little bit that I do know, as I, I need to say that, um, that when, and I think this is pretty typical in indigenous cultures, that, for instance, Mama Norberto, he's the grand uh, mama there, and the, he's called the spiritual geographer of the whole of the Sierra Nevadas de Santa Marta. He's 94 years old, and he was thought into being uh, long before he was even conceived. So in indigenous cultures, again, the, from what I understand, and I may be wrong, but I understand that when um, that there are elders or medicine people or shamans, whatever you want to call them, that have a sense of very deep knowing and they look for signs and signals or receiving information or guidance, from perhaps, let's say, the the ancestors in the other realms about an infant or child that is about to be born. And when that child is born, there are certain signs, again, that show them that this is a child to be taken, to be taught, or that will become something that would be, you know, in part of their culture, very significant. And this happens in the, in the Kogi culture, um, that a child when it's born, does not leave, uh, when it, it, it's kept in a hut for nine years without going outside, without seeing the light, uh, without uh, any um, connection to any uh, anything outside that little realm where it is kept and taught and trained and guided. And, and I don't know what goes on there. I can't even say that. Um, but that is what, that is the beginning of the life of a male that becomes a mama. A mama is, a, a, I guess we might say, like a shaman or a holy person or a person who has certain capabilities that would benefit the greater whole of all the community. And in relation to the Kogi themselves, because their works relate to the harmonizing of all of the world, that that's a very significant part of their I don't want to say training, but I guess you could call it training. Um, so they they are then, you know, taken and and given instructions and taught and and whatever else goes on in there, you know, uh, in that dark place for nine years, and then they they are still um, in nine years old when they appear. Um, I cannot say what goes on then, but I'm assuming that they are still brought along with the elder mamas to continue their um, their training the works that that they are uh, to be you know to be going towards mm-hmm. and that's sort of controversial isn't it I, I remember seeing um i don't remember the name of the film but it was pretty much the only film the bbc did i believe um about the kogi and was uh, it the elder was it the elder brother's message yes I think that's the one that that they find they did expose themselves because they were so concerned about what was happening in to the earth because they have you know the where they live um, the um, the ecosystem there it relates pretty much mirrors the whole of the earth there's um, it's a singular ecosystem there are wetlands there's tropical rainforest and like Alp- alpine tundra as well, and even s- desert and snow-capped peaks are there. And and so they, being tuned in, and the capabilities that they have and their relationship to the elemental world, they became very alarmed because they noticed that things started to change drastically. And they actually said that they went to, or they implored or or asked the way they do the sacred mother herself if they could expose themselves to the world so that they could warn the younger brothers about what was happening we are called the younger brothers 
all of those outside of that realm where mm-hmm. they live. We are known to them as the younger brothers. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, so this is a big deal. They, this is now them coming off the mountain for the first time. That's right. I mean, when I met um, Mama, Mama Bernardo two years ago, he was then in that film one of the main uh, mamas that was speaking. And as I watched the film, it, it just, as many people say, I just felt a deep uh, connection and very sad and, and it, awe. It was an awe. And uh, there, this man, this mama was uh, Mama Bernardo, and I met him two years ago. He's in his 90s now. And um, never in my wildest dreams would I ever imagine that I would ever meet this man or the Kogi. And um, <clears throat> so, yes, the controversy uh, about, you mean, keeping a person in a room right. in a dark place for nine years? Yeah. Yeah, well... I don't know. You see, I feel this is, I have to keep returning to the fact that this is such an ancient culture um, and their ways, um, what this does is prepares a person to um, be able to do their sacred works, to continue their law of origins and their cultures that, that relates to the harmonizing of the earth, all of the earth. That's their concern. That's their purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's what so, I find yeah. fascinating about them is that, you know, no matter what position you want to take, oh, mm-hmm. that's a primitive culture, or wow, they, you know, they really are doing that. In their minds, their entire life's work is to help all of us. And I, I find right. that just completely, fantastically compassionate. It's pretty uh, humbling, I must say. And um, it just. It, for me, personally, I started to look at what I am doing. What am I doing? You know, here these people have been for centuries praying for us and for all of life. And, you know, I, I, I'm a pretty spiritual person. You know, I mean, I pray daily and I do ceremony. And But I felt like I was just a little drop in the bucket here, you know, that, that I need to do more, that we need to do more, that here these people are, their whole life is in a way sacrificing for all of us. And um, that touched me very deeply, and it's brought me to realize um, a lot of different things um, in relation to our part uh, and what people people are feeling fearful and hopeless and helpless and and I realized that we can do something, and perhaps uh, this is why they've come out also to talk, talk to us, to, to tell us things. And, and here's another interesting thing. Since I've met the Kogi, I've met more people who've never met them, but yet tell me I've had them in my dreams. They've come to me in my dreams. And I'm thinking, this is very interesting, because they have the ability to do that, by the way and uh, some of us also, but specifically, why are these Kogi people coming into people's dreams? You know, and that started me thinking, well, you know, they're really reaching out to us. And I think that they are really reaching out to us so that we can perhaps begin to do what maybe we haven't been doing that, that to, to help them, to help the world, to help, to help ourselves. So that's mm-hmm. something else that has really come very strongly to me. And they have two dilemmas, right? One is, of course, the ecosystem around the Sierra Nevadas is just getting hammered by modernity and, and well, they the have made yeah. They have there's. It's interesting because I went to see the movie Avatar, and um, somebody sent me a little note, uh, email about how Avatar is affecting people, how people are getting depressed and suicidal. And I started looking up online. I said, I have to check this out, what's going on, you know. And I realized that, you know, people are saying that they feel depressed because they can't go to a place like that. They can't go to Pandora. And they want that tribal experience. They want that brotherhood. People, These are people's words. And, and a woman wrote that she felt like sad because she's living on a dying planet. So... I, I came to the realization that um, we do have a paradise here, 
and it is being affected by corporate greed. What's happening on Avatar in a movie is happening here, and it's really happening in the Sierra Nevadas de Santa Marta, in the heart of the world. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really happening there. And uh, the sacredness that of the land and the trees and the animals that Avatar shows us is what is, you know, is, is here also. And this is what the indigenous people, all indigenous people, have lived by before they became, you know, nearly obliterated with their beliefs and, and uh, inundated with other religions. And, you know, mm -hmm. that was lost nearly. But the indigenous people throughout the world, if you want to, if you want to align the, the indigenous on Avatar, you know, the, the Nave, I guess they're called, right? Then... It's really the same thing that in it's people are calling this a fictional, you know, fictional movie, but it's not fiction. It's really happening here. And the premise of the movie is that the it's way in the future, of course. And what has happened on the earth is that the earth is completely depleted. And therefore, now they're off to another place and they've come to this place called Pandora where there's an indigenous culture there and there are resources there that the corporate world wants and the destruction begins not only of the earth and sacred trees sacred places but the creatures and the people as well does this sound familiar oh well, yeah yeah and so it's really it's to me they're already preparing to go off world you know that's nothing new so it's sort of like avatar is really showing us what's what the future is going to, what's going to be happening. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that people have a paradise here, and those people that, and there, there is a, you can have that brotherhood, you can have that sisterhood, and you can have that relationship to the elemental world and the beauty and the healing that the earth and the waters and everything that does give us. So that's our, that's our innate nature to be in relation to that. But but people have been so separate from it. Uh, and then the, the other problem that the Kogi have, specifically, I suppose, uh, is that some of the younger people want to go off and be westernized, right? And so there's a, the risk of losing well, says, their traditions. Yeah. Well, the, the, um, the people, the Concormo, for instance, they were lower, I guess they were down lower on the, in the Sierra Nevadas, more subject to western ways, and they pretty much lost their law of origins. They lost their culture, their original culture. And um, the four Pueblos together originally were meant to do sacred works together. And the Kogi held on to, uh, this is what I understand, the Kogi held on to the specific, um, let's say, traditions that the Concuarmo would um, offer or, or take part in that would link with the Kogi, Wiwa, and the Arwaka ways, which would combine a whole, you know, mm -hmm. close the circle, in other words, of their sacred works. And so now the Conquarmos are actually working with Kogi and the other Pueblos to regain their um, original instructions or their origins. And But yes, they have been inundated with Western ways and the, pe the young people, and that's happened in in all indigenous cultures throughout the world, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, they're being drawn away from their their culture. And there's a big threat there, very big threat. And so have you been around the mountain to help with, um, I'm not certain what they do uh, at these very sacred sites around the mountain, but you, you've helped them with whatever that is, right? Well, I have been asked myself when I went in August, to this gathering, and um, it was a very historic gathering of indigenous people in Pasto. I was invited there, and my uh, friend and, and interpreter, and, uh, Rick Harlow, he spent 20 years in the, in the um, in Colombian rainforest working with indigenous people, and he and I were asked by the Kogi that we met there if we would help them to raise funds for this sacred journey um, that is actually happening. It's beginning tomorrow. My partner, Rick, is there now, and I will be meeting them. I'm leaving on the 28th um, <clears throat> to meet up with them. The sacred journey 
uh, is to 54 sacred sites uh, around the base of the Sierra Nevadas, the heart of the world. And it's, um, it's an energetic boundary that, that contains um, the heart of the mother uh, there that harmonizes everything. And the 54 sacred sites, uh, again, is part of their ancient uh, sacred ways that is necessary for them to go to each of these 54 sacred sites to do what they say, leave a pagamento, or it's a spiritual offering, and do sacred things there that, again, I, I don't know what that is, but they work with all elements um, in in harmonizing and balancing and purifying and and assisting in this kind of nature, this, this um, elemental nature. But these so sites, do they not... Um... Uh, do they not correspond with different places in the world? Yes, they do. Well, the heart of the world there, of course, would correspond with the rest of, of the world in many ways. You know, the waters, for instance, the sacred waters that, that they work with there, of course, go throughout the whole world, and the, the trees and the plant life and the whole system is part of the whole world, and they are particularly in the heart of the world. And I do know that there are other places um, in the world that other indigenous cultures speak about that the earth as a living being and that, for instance, when I went to, um, four years ago, I went to um, Easter Island and an elder there told me that that island there, that place there in the Pacific Ocean is represents the womb of the Mother Earth. And there are other places in Navajo country and Lakota territory and other places that I'm not familiar with, but I know that many indigenous cultures speak of places, sacred places, as a living part of the mother. Right, that that there is, you know, one is the kidneys, one is the liver, that sort of thing. That's right. So it's almost acupuncture for the world. (laughs) It is. Yes, absolutely it is. It's like, well, you know, when you have... For instance, one of their main um, sources of water that goes from the high Sierras to the um, rip to the ocean um, is um, this big. There's now a threat of putting up dams. They, the corporate political people, want to dam up the rivers, and they're really um, putting up a lot of push on this. And what that will do is block the natural flow of that that life of the energy, the life of the Mother Earth, of course. And uh, as is happening in different parts, as we hear about different indigenous peoples being, you know, threatened and inundated with, with, you know, mining on their properties, on the lands, on the sacred mountains, for for instance, in Navajo country and Black Mountain, there's a Peabody mine there, I think, that is really destroyed destroying the mountain and and that's i think is they call that the liver of the mother um but the there are places that these dams will basically harm you know do a great harm ecologically it's very sensitive wetlands there there's fisheries there and there's one of the sacred sites called Jukulwa, it's a very it's a very important sacred site. It will they will not have access to that. The mm-hmm. indigenous people, it will be blocked off to them. And so these kinds of things, if you really if you think about what you just said about um, acupressure or acu acu acupressure or acupoints um, the, on the body on a human body, how we go to an acupuncturist or we get that we get the the work to open the body's natural flow when there's blocked energy, we become ill. And um, it's the same thing if we look at the the earth as a living being, that all of these sources of her life are very crucial for her well-being and and for all of us. So if you block off these natural flows of water or destroy the forests, um, you know, these things have a dramatic effect. Uh, not only physically but spiritually on this life. Mm-hmm. I have uh, one more question, then I'll hand it over to Jeff. Um, which is some of these sites along the mountain. Um, you know, I saw the little um, the, the pamphlet that Melissa Reed had given to me. Yes. Explaining them, and some of them sound like um, like 
you would expect a local name of some sacred site to be, you know. But some of them sounded like oddly ancient, universal-sounding sites. Can you give us a couple of those and tell us what what you know about well, them? Well, there are there's two languages here that you may have read. Well, one of them is Spanish, and the other one is their ancient language, which I may not be pr- pronouncing correctly at all. Um, but when they go to these sacred sites, as I said, they give offerings and uh, they use certain elements uh, as these offerings and um, they relate to all of life as the mother uh, the mother so they might have I'll try to pronounce this this is Imakamuke or or Imakamuke is um, this is a place where um, is one of the sacred sites and um, this relates to the mother of air, of water, of lightning, and earthquakes. And then there's another place, a sacred site, called Unkwika, or Unkwika. Again, I don't know the exact pronunciation, but that's where they give uh, pagamentos or offerings to the mother um, of the sap of the trees. And now some of these, some of these words seem so familiar. You know um, that, and of course I'm. I don't know how I'm pronouncing them, but there's a Konchiaku or Konchiaku. It's a place where the door of sicknesses are, and so they give offerings there to help those who may be sick. They have offerings, Java Kumakun Shikara. <laughs> it says the mother of all of the wild flowers, and. Um, they have uh, all, they touch on all of the elementals, all of life, uh, the place of the dances of nature, the places for the lions or domesticated animals, uh, place of the doves, the mother of the doves, the mother of the dances, the mother of large clay jars. All of these things are parts of elements that are crucial for life and to harmonize life. Mm-hmm. And but then there there are some that are like the well, wasn't there one of the sciences the sacred oh yeah where is that that was really inc- incredible well they have one here ara katacha it's where offerings are made to the negative forces in order to maintain universal equilibrium and there's another one where they make an offering for the understanding and knowledge that directs and orients themselves like the mamas so there's a place where they need to make offerings because this particular place uh, aligns the mamas with their understanding and the knowledge that will direct them and a pagamento to avoid war pagamento for spiritual paths i'm looking for that one i i was so struck by these um it's so beautiful Here's even one where they make offerings are made here so that the offerings themselves can be heard in full magnitude. <laughs> it's it's just so beautiful and deep and uh, complex. And I think just their relationship to the elements, the world, and, and life in that manner is beyond, just beyond our comprehension. Mm-hmm. And, and it's so ancient. I guess I have to start out by saying that, uh, Barbara, I'm, I'm relatively ignorant of all things Kogi. And I, okay. I, I purposefully didn't look at anything before the show because I'd rather, I'd rather talk to somebody about it than I would read about it. Um, right. Especially someone like you who's had a direct interaction with these people. And, and I guess in listening to everything tonight, I'm curious. It seems like... Like you say, they've devoted their lives or their existence uh, to keeping this planet in check uh, and, and doing things for the betterment of everyone. Right. I guess my question would be, in what sense uh, do you get from them that what, what, what would we be doing? What, what should we be doing uh, mm-hmm. in tandem with what they feel they have to do? What would they suggest that we do because as i said last night to jeremy it's it's hard to fight city hall (laughs) and it's it's uh, you've got these corporations who will do pretty much as they damn well please uh where they please to do it 
and, and have done so at least in this part of the world for as long as I can remember. And I brought up last night to Jeremy, you know, the, the story of the Dr. Seuss, the Lorax uh, uh, story where, you know, the uh, who will speak for the trees and, and this sort of thing. And uh, and we, we all know how that ended up, that there there were no more trees left by the time, you know, the, that, that, that corporate entities got done with it. So there was nothing left. So I guess what uh, what would they tell you that the individual could do to work in tandem with this? That's a very good question, and um, I haven't received an answer from them. Mm -hmm. Um, I hope to when I go to see them again in uh, another week or so. But my own feeling, and I just wrote some people um, a a letter about this, that I think that during this time, specifically from the tomorrow to the 29th, they will be journeying uh, to these sacred sites and... As I mentioned earlier that I felt like um, I questioned myself about my own practices, about what am I doing, you know. I think I pray and I think I'm connected, but it doesn't come to, you know, up to half of what these people have been doing for centuries for us. And I guess I've just, um, I've come personally to the conclusion that I I do need to do more, and I've actually been gathering people on a regular basis uh, to do uh, prayer meditation and uh, harmonizing visualization, just to sit and talk about opening our hearts and having an intention of healing and harmonizing. I can't go any further than that. I mean, I don't know exactly what these people are doing, but I know it's somewhat in relation to that. They have a, a more powerful, profound ability, but I think we also do, and I think we have to, I think we need to um, come together more, uh, to have an intention. Uh, I've been talking about the new paradigm. We're heading there whether we want to go or not. So what are we going to do? I think we have the ability to create as co-creators. We are constantly creating either a mess or whatever because if, if we're in disharmony, that's what we're creating. If we're in fear, we're creating that too. And, and I don't think that exists in their realm But I will tell you um, a little bit of information that was pretty stunning that I received um, several months ago, um, a letter from them, Kogi, that um, they meet quite frequently in in conference or uh, groups to, uh, they can meet for weeks at a time uh, to determine certain things. They do divination work and they work in a realm that they call Luna. Uh, and a, a Luna is a realm where that they are capable of going. It's an, it's a, a, another dimension. Uh, they go there through ritual and meditation, and they have communion there in that a Luna world um, with other beings. And so, when they were meeting a while back, some of the mamas were saying how they felt that it's too late, that we have gone beyond making any difference so i'm reading this and i'm feeling this alarm because i'm thinking wow if these people with what they know and what they're capable of are saying it's too late we've gone beyond help what should we be thinking what should we do how can we keep going what what do we do now but then some of the other mamas you know there's all different levels of mamas some of them are much older some of them are younger I don't know who was speaking, but some of the mamas said that they felt that um, it is not up to them to stop their sacred works. They were given this purpose, this job, I call it a job, and it's not up to them to make this determination that it's too late, that they will know that it's the sacred one, the being, the creator, whatever you want to call it, that is the one that will make that determination. It is not up to them to say, well, it's too late, let's just stop, let's just give up. Because it's, you know, well, we could, we've come, some of us have come to that place. We've come to that point where we say, well, it's hopeless, what can we do? Look at the corporations, they do what they want to do, and what can we do? But these people, with all that they are meeting, all that they are being inundated with by exposing themselves and all that they have done for centuries, still came to the conclusion after really seeing very clearly where we are, 
we are at a very, very crucial point, that they determine that, no, they must continue with their sacred works, what they were given to do, it's not up to them to pull the plug. Right. And that, that was very important information. So I think that, that we do have, all of us have, a capability to create. We do it on a regular basis. And, but I think we need to become a little bit more conscious of what we want to create and take part in that in, in the best way that we can. You know, and of course, we don't, we're not kept in a dark room for nine years. And we don't, we don't have these kinds of capabilities, but we do still have, we have good hearts. We know what it feels like to send out love and to focus on peace and harmony. We know what it is like to have forgiveness, to want harmony and balance, to focus on that. We know what that's like. And I right. think that this is what we have the capability to do. And that's our choice. Either, we're, either we are going to do that or we aren't. You know, we have, do you, we have those choices. Right. Do you think that... Um in addition to the excuse me to the tangible things that are affecting this this planet in a negative way, pollution mm -hmm. uh, and everything that goes along with that, mm -hmm. do you think that equally the intention and the mindset of the world? Uh, I mean, I don't. I only know the United States. I know the people that I interact with every day, and uh, and I know what I see on the news. Uh, that that's going on and, and kind of the consensus of America mm -hmm. uh, is very depressed, is mm -hmm. very hope, filled with hopelessness. Yes, it is. Yes. Uh, I don't know if that translates into other nations, what other nations are feeling, but I'm sure everybody's feeling the pinch of just about everything these days as we're all yeah. connected, uh, you know, through various mediums. Uh, right. Do you think that that has as much, or, or maybe half the Kogi told you that that has as much to do with why uh, this planet is perceived as being sick, uh, every bit as much as the tangible pollution that, that's surrounding everything? Well, I believe that, and I, as again, I can't speak for them, but I have a suspicion that that's part of it. I mean, they did speak about a sorcerer. I call it a dark energy or a dark force, they speak of it as a sorcerer. They said that there is a sorcerer at work that is affecting all of us. And it's affecting political people, it's affecting everyone, it's affect and they didn't say the media, but I say the media. I include the, the media because there is something that is very uh, dark and a, a, and a source of energy that is affecting all of us. And I think that the more that escalates, we have to be more strong. I think we have to really, really hold ourselves strong because I think that sort of that is occurring. They spoke of this as, a, as the sorcerer. Right. The sorcerer is at work. So mm -hmm. I think we have to be aware that there are energies that are flying around, and if you are in fear or whatever you're in the negative, if people have negativity, that's adding food to that sorcerer. And uh, so we have we have a great power, I feel, that we don't recognize as uh, our thoughts, our actions, and words are very powerful, as you know. Sure. Uh, we experience that all the time, but we have to look at it on a bigger picture. We have to understand energetically how we are really creating um, also. You know? yeah. So uh, I, I, have, I have six points that I wanted to emphasize here in relation to what we're talking about. Please. Um, that, that is in relation to the, the new paradigm and also our own sacred works. It's, in a way, it's preservation and shifting our consciousness. And um, number one would be the need to build a new spirit, a new mind, and a new body. And number two is to take responsibility for the new paradigm. What is it that we want to dream? What, what do we want to manifest? And three is to manifest and to dream consciously, to actually take an active part in this dream consciously. And four would be to preserve and to communicate with the living earth. And five is to solicit the earth wisdom because it is there. 
And six is to be in trust and faith and to open ourselves to the spiritual technology that will bring us into this new paradigm, this new time. Hmm. Okay. I know, and I know that it, at least for our audience, coming from me, that that it's going to sound a little odd because <clears throat> I think that more than anything, I think people see me as the uber skeptic and the uh, <laughs> okay. and the uh, and well, the. Uh, that's good to be that way, though. Too sh- sure, like sure. Yeah. But I, I can tell you that um, in, in no uncertain terms that exactly what you're talking about about visualization and intention and all of these things that uh, I became uh, blindingly aware of such things uh, after what watching a documentary that most people consider to be the epitome of New Agey, airy, fairy uh, stuff. But nonetheless, I've seen the, the intention thing even in, in the premise of this show, which is the paranormal uh, mm-hmm. happenings around uh, everything from ghosts to UFOs to you name it, uh, yeah. that that the intention and the focus and sometimes the obsession yeah. uh, with such topics can make things manifest in your life. So I'm I'm completely on the same page with all of that. And I I have to say that I, I'm glad to hear you, at least you kind of say the same thing as I do, is that it's it's every bit uh, it's every bit to do with us and, and what we focus upon as it is what we're doing. Um, and that the two things really aren't separate <laughs> when you really think about it. They're not right. all that separate. Yeah. If we walk around with this mindset that, well, we're going to hell in a handbasket and there's nothing anybody can do about it. So yeah. what now? You know, it's yeah. kind of like, I, I feel like a lot of people have thrown their hands up or in fact, the opposite, which is that they've become more obsessed with the, the tangible gadgets and their toys mean everything. And, and, yeah. and I, I almost, I almost pictured, I was doing a drawing today of, you know, somebody counting his money while, you know, the, 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 the building is literally burning down around them. And that's kind of how I see a lot of this stuff as, as being, and, and, and uh, you know, I'll be curious to see what the Kogi tells you that what, what are we supposed to do is, as, as people who aren't necessarily a, a big cog of that wheel of, corporate America that seems to do what it wants. What can the little person do? You know, one person can change the world. We know this. And uh, for, for better or worse. Yeah, uh, so that'll be the thing that I'll, I'll be curious. Now, I, I don't know, kind of going towards the the premise of this program a lot is uh, when you have visited with the Kogi, do you see, I guess, anything knowledge-wise that they know or that they're all too familiar with? that just makes your jaw hit the floor in the sense that these people have been isolated from society in general for so many years. Is there anything that gives you pause to say, now how could they possibly, possibly know that? Well, you know, it's funny because today I was talking to someone about faith, and I was talking to them in relation to um, what faith is, and how we humans are always looking for validation. Mm -hmm. And that gives us faith, but it's no longer going to be validation that's going to give us the faith. And we have to find the faith within ourselves, like the Kogi do, Mm -hmm. without looking for, you know, the monumental, you know, light coming down or the book falling open to the The big brass, the brass ring, right. You know, and that's what people, that's what we're, we've been, we've sort of, had that in our lives. I mean, people who have spiritual experiences, for instance, are now calling me and saying, "I'm I've, suddenly I'm all alone. Where is everybody? I feel lost. Nobody's nobody's present. I feel detached. I feel in the dark. I'm experiencing this lonely place, and I can so identify with that. And I've come to the realization that, well, part of the new paradigm, I think, is that we are meant to actually uh, draw upon our own resources. Um, that we can no longer keep turning and asking those beings, give me validation now, are you still there? Then I know, then I can have trust and faith. Because that's not, I think the new paradigm is about it, our developing ourselves on a, on a bigger, more enlightened scale. And that has nothing to do with turning to someone and saying, give me the sign now so I know that I'm okay. Right. You know? 
And so, but that's always, we, we have to realize this. This is, what is the new paradigm? You, re, you know, the new paradigm is a big shift. It's something is ending and something's beginning. But just, for instance, this is a message from the elders, the Kogi, and they said little brothers, because they call us little brothers. How is it possible that you have no knowledge of the law of origins that was given you? We see through a secret science how to take care of, to protect, and conserve the wilderness of nature from the spiritual level as also from the traditional knowledge. So, you know, they have this knowledge. They know it's there. They don't, they are not looking to be validated. They are doing their work. They're not waiting for somebody to say you're right or, or look at the sign to show that you're right or are you right? You know, this is an, such an ancient connection these people have that, you know, even when it comes down to some of them realizing that, that we may have gone beyond hope, that they say, no, well, we, we, know, we know what we must be doing, and that's what we've been given. And we also have to come to that. I truly believe that. And you don't think that, I mean, I mean, in that sense, is their ancient knowledge, uh, would it be the same as ours? Is it something that they could teach us, or is this something we're going to have to ultimately find on our own? Well, I think that, I don't think it's so easy to infiltrate into this culture. You know, it's yeah, not that's, so for, just, that's for sure. <laughs> it really isn't, and it's not something that it's sort of like, uh, you know, let's, talk about the Lakota, for instance. The Lakota people uh, have been inundated with Western ways, and plenty of people have made their way to their reservations and say, you know, I, wanna, I want to learn, I want to teach, I want you to teach me. And some, some of them have had that experience, but also that was part of the, the I understand, part of a prophecy that the indigenous people in this part of the world were told that the white brothers or white people would be coming looking to, for them to have, for help. Uh -huh. um, now I don't know if that's something that the Kogi have had in their in their knowledge. I don't know. Um, I can't say that. But I think that for us personally, I think we are all on a spiritual path. We are all on a path. We're all seeking. Um, and I think that we have teachers. But I've had my own experience where my teacher is gone now. My physical teacher, Wallace Black Oak. But right. I also had guides and all my life, and they dropped away. And that put me spinning. It really was like I had to look at that, and I said, what is this all about? And then I started to hear other people say the same thing to me. And so then I really started to look, okay, something's going on here. Why? Why are we suddenly now being like seemingly like we're thrown out into the abyss with nobody, you know, no parachute? And but I'm looking at that as okay, this is a new level that we are we're really being guided to to come to a new level. We can no longer rely on this validation or these beings. They're hoping they've given us enough that we can go forward now and really, really do our works, right. really, really be strong really, really be connected. And that's our journey. That's mm. what I feel. Okay. And, and just a, a question that is kind of a connective tissue on this show is, uh, are you familiar at all if any of the Kogi elders or uh, shaman uh, avail themselves of, of what you would call the classic shamanic tool, whether it be psychoactive plants or brews or things like this to enter into altered states, or do they do that strictly through meditative practice? Well, I'm only going to mention a little bit that I know, uh, because it was told to me specifically when I went there and sat with some of them. I brought, I was guided to bring some elemental gifts to them. Uh, one of them was red earth from Africa. It was given to me by someone who goes there over the years to work with uh, children who have AIDS. I was given crystals from India by someone from a very sacred place in India. I was given shells uh, from someone else from the ocean at the, I guess, south, I guess in the Carolinas, and various things like that, and a garnet that my father had uh, 
taken from the earth many, many years ago. Um, I was guided to bring these things. I didn't know why or what would happen, but when I went to them, I asked their interpreter if I could uh, be guided by this person to do this, to give gift these things to them in the right way, in the respectful way, because I, mm-hmm. I didn't know how to do this. I wanted to be respectful. I know how to approach an elder in the Lakota tradition, but I don't know how to approach an elder in that tradition. So I was um, guided then to sit with them, and I told them the things that I had. Well, I'll tell you something. The first thing what happened was, this is really interesting, uh, the night that we all gathered, all of the indigenous people, this was in Pasto, the city of Pasto in Colombia. We were taken to a monastery in the middle of the city, where they housed us all, and then we would be taken to various venues, talks, panels, ceremonies. And so that night, when I, uh, it was very exciting and a lot of energy, and I was having a hard time going to sleep, um, but that night, this uh, Mama Norberto, this 94-year-old uh, Arhuaco elder that I saw there, uh, came, um, appeared in my room, mm. and uh, and I heard the words red earth and the next day when I was talking to their interpreter I said I have some gifts that I've brought and I would like to give them could you please guide me in the respectful way I said I brought some crystals from India I brought a garnet I brought some red earth from Africa and she looked at me and her eyes got wide and she said I have chills all over my body and I said well (laughs) I said, why? And she said, well, last night we were speaking, we were all talking together, and Mama Norberto suddenly said that he needed red earth. Hmm. Okay. So, all right, so now I'm with them, and I'm, I'm holding these offerings, and I said, I didn't give them. They, they directed pretty much what each one of them needed to work with. Each one of these mamas work with different elements, or all of the elements. Specifically, I don't know, but that day they wanted significant ones. So I didn't hand them. They said, they bo- they they basically held out their hand when I said I have these shells, and they all kind of looked at each other, or they looked, or they looked at one of the elders, and the elder held out his hand. He was the one that needed those shells, hmm. and I gave the. I did give the red earth to Mama Norberto, though, because of that experience. And mm-hmm. uh, the, the garnet, they all jumped. They wanted the garnet. And they all kind of made fun to fight over this garnet in a, in a, kind, of a kind of a friendly you know, way. But then they said to me, we need garnets. We all need to work with these, this garnet. We need this because this represents the blood of the mother. Huh. And so they said a little bit about what they did. I'll tell you, for instance, the mama who had the shell, he said, and, and the interpreter interpreted what he said, that he uses these shells to capture bad thoughts. Okay. And the other thing that he uses the shells with is to ward off hurricanes that come from the ocean areas and things like that. Oh. So. I don't know how they do it. I don't know the process, but I was I thought that was pretty profound and very beautiful and special. I will um, never put my ear up to another shell again. Yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, I know. or or you could hold it out and capture bad thoughts. Right. <laughs> yeah. Anything yeah. coming at you? <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah. I'll have to take one to work. Um Now I do know, I think that uh as far as how they transport themselves into the Aluna, I can't say. I don't know. Um, I've had some of my own experiences of being transported, you know, as maybe you have or others. Um, it takes a concentration. It takes a focus. It takes a certain frame of, you know, physical and mindset and emotion. Uh, but I don't know their process. You know, but I think we all have that capability, and it's something that we um, can aspire to and practice, and we can achieve. Uh, well, I guess the last thing will be uh, for me, at least, before I flip it to Jared to close us out, is uh, uh, 
Uh, I took a trip many, many, many years ago to Pine Bush to the, the, the Hudson oh, Valley yeah. area. That's very near me. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I know. Uh, and it is a. Uh, I came away from there frightened, to say the least. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I came away from there thinking that this is truly the strangest place I've ever been to in my life. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, um, it is. Among other uh, reasons. <laughs> uh, yeah, I. Uh, uh, I mean, among other things, I witnessed a very large golden ball of light near a mountain. Uh huh. And that, that frightened is, you. Did that frighten uh, you? Uh, well, it frightened me in the sense that uh, my research partner and I uh, actually took off after it. And, and as we went up the side of this mountain after it, uh, we could no longer see it. But apparently it was still there, and, and we could not see it. The only place right. we could see it was from a nearby town that I, I think the biggest landmark that I could give you as a reference point is that there is a, a, a large... Uh, target on the ground where people used to take uh or maybe still do take hand gliding lessons in this oh place. yes 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 it was that mountain right there we were at oh, the yeah. store and wow, uh, that's, and, saw that's, that. yeah. and 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 also um we we saw a strange animal there that didn't belong uh, <laughs> at well, all you know those you know those animals i was guided to be told i was told that animals from other realms may have been here before will hmm. be coming through uh, parallel the parallel you know curtain will be appearing in times uh, as we draw nearer and that's been happening a lot of people have, and also animals have been doing very strange behavior oh yeah yeah odd well, animal sightings and yeah well there the I mean if that's the case then you know upper upstate New York is rife with lemurs uh, <laughs> But, uh, well, there uh, was actually somebody did. Wow, you saw you saw what looked like a lemur. Uh, yes, Some, yes, ma'am. Somebody yes. saw someone years ago told me they lived pretty remote in the Woodstock area, out on a farm in the mountain, and they looked out in their old apple tree, and there was this very strange animal with this ringed tail, yeah. long ringed tail, and they were like, "What is that? Wow, you." Saw that would be it. a lemur. <laughs> yeah, that would be a lemur. Uh, yeah, we wow. well, we we actually saw that at the McDonald's of all places out <laughs> out behind there. We were trying to take a nap. I mean, it was just oh, getting towards McDonald's. dusk. There was this little <laughs> fella sitting on a on a little fence post, and I'm like, "That's a lemur." <laughs> um, and, and also, as uh, I have to say that that as we were driving down uh, Searsville Road, where we had driven all day long, uh, there was always one particular spot. That was very nondescript is the best way I can put it. There were cows there during the daytime, but at night when the cows got put away, yeah. uh, it was an empty field. And uh, I have no other way to describe it other than uh, it seemed like it seemed like we had driven out onto a baseball field during a game. Uh, there were just there were just hundreds of people, hundreds of eyes uh, looking at you. It was very uncomfortable. Uh, not long after that, we left. We left probably, uh, I'd venture to say, probably between 3 and 4 in the morning. And as we left, uh, as we went past that very convenience store that I mentioned earlier, yeah. uh, there was a, a quite a large ball or sphere of smoke beside the road. And it was mm-hmm. very tightly contained. And all of that. Now, I'm curious uh, that you know you've lived in this area your your whole life, and and yeah. uh, and I'm sure that at some point you've you've spoken to indigenous people who may be able to tell you what is, what is going on with that area. What what is it about that place? Uh, yeah. Because to to experience so much stuff in one relatively yeah. small area, yeah, is a little. Ridiculous, and I've not had anything like that aside from Gulf Breeze, Florida, which is another one that is on my list as a very weird place. Uh, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, both of them gorgeous places. But um, you well, know, there were just, certain yeah, there are certain areas here that are I guess you would call them vortexes that pull in you know these kinds of energies that appear through you know through those realms, through those parallel realms. But that's one of them, and uh, you know when I started speaking i said you know i was born here in the capital the ufo capital of the world <laughs> right. tag 
And I've had, oh, I've had many experiences since I was a child, all through my whole life here in the Hudson Valley, in spheres and iridescent spheres and globes and strange things and lost time and UFOs and beings and it's, yeah, it seems is it, is it is it for you, is it ultimately something that's connected to a spot on the earth that, uh, that allows for this, these kinds of things or... I, I mean, well, I mean, and I asked this for a simple question that, that that years ago, you know, past twenty years ago, when I first got into this, and we were talking about, uh, or I was talking about golf breeze with a, a researcher that I had a lot of respect for, uh, and I said, "Why do you think golf breeze?" And his answer was, "I think golf breeze because people show up to see them," and 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 you have to wonder that. Uh, I, I know that the native peoples in that area in, in upstate New York um, do regard that place as a sacred place. Well, it's uh, very much known as a sacred place, an indigenous sure. uh, place, absolutely. And, the, I, you know, the it, I mean, it's very beautiful here, but it is, there's an energy here that is um, very palpable to many people. And in the indigenous cultures here, it, it was known as a very sacred place, you know. And, um it's a valley, you know, and it's a distinct valley um, here, and there's some kind of a force, energy, vortex uh, thing that, and but I don't think people originally showed up and they appeared. They they appeared and then people showed up. Sure, right. You know, so I don't know about that other place you're talking about, but there are so many people here in this valley, in this whole Hudson Valley, that have had sightings and experiences. Uh, it's pretty amazing. You know, can I so, can I ask you? Um, yeah. uh, this is uh, this is the last thing. I am I am actually going to turn it over to Jeremy. Uh, uh, the biggest thing that I noticed up there is is come the night, it's like black barts coming to town. <laughs> the, the window shades go down, the doors yep. get locked, the lights go right. off. The only thing that's lit up is the McDonald's, <laughs> and those people clearly don't want to be there. Uh-huh. So, I mean. Uh, yeah, well, what's what's that all about? I mean, yeah, uh, are, are people in that area? Are they are they afraid? I mean, I I know that the the woman that contacted us about coming up in the first place was afraid, but she was not uh, a local resident for many years. Yeah, well, uh, I've never been afraid except for my first experience when I was about five. That was pretty terrifying. Um, but I have never been afraid since then. Uh, but you know, I mean, I've had, I've had my first experience was with reptilian people, which I, and I was never a follower of the UFO, you know, syndicate or whatever you want to call it. I was not a person who <laughs> followed the UFO tracks or got onto any of that, and I just did my own thing. So I didn't know anything about these beings until many years later. I just finally started looking at stuff. And people's experiences with the reptilians have been pretty bad, I guess. But mine have been pretty profound um, in, 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 I would say, extraordinary. And it led me to understand something uh, very deep about um, my whole life. And also, uh, I understand there are good and bad and positive and negative in every area. And I don't think we can lump anybody into one category like we try not to do that with people. You know, uh, we look at people and we see the color, their color of their skin, and and people have a, you know, a, a way of just lumping them into a category. And I don't think we can do that with these beings. You know, I don't think that that, I think that people fall into that same kind of habit, you know. But my experience with these with these beings has been pretty profound. I'll close with one question. Well, first, I just want to make an observation that it's interesting when you use the word um, primitive to describe the Kogi and other tribes. It's very easy to think that you're the person who's above, that there's an above and below relationship. And so the Western mind says, well, they're primitive – and they need to prove to us, you know, until we can see the step-by-step material processes involved, it's not real to us. But when you switch that word primitive to ancient, the way you have been doing this whole time, yeah, well, that's a completely different ballgame, isn't it? Because now they're ancient, and now we're like the little kid just asking why, 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 why. That's right. And uh, we're not the ones 
higher in that relationship. We just don't know it because kids are right. sort of narcissistic by nature. <laughs> yes, that's a very good, very good point because that's really come to me very strongly. That's why I use that word because it is an ancient knowledge that they that they hold, and uh, I'm I'm just touching on, like I said, the very tip of what that really means, and it's just very striking and deep and mind-blowing because these are people who are very ancient. They hold an ancient knowledge that has been for centuries not touched by outside influence at all, and here they are in our presence, and they have something basically to tell us, and, uh, and, and what they're doing, they're showing us something that they have been doing, and I believe that it's something that, that we can take responsibility. I think we're meant to take responsibility for as well, and we've lost that. We have lost our original instructions, and I think that's what people are feeling a lot of sorrow about. I think that's why people are just going back to the movie Avatar for three and four and five times because of what is what that shows on some level, you know, um, that connection and that, and uh, there's that's missing in our in our culture, but it's certainly not been missed with the Kogi at all. Mm-hmm. And are you? We haven't yeah. asked this. Are you fundraising? Um, um, yes, the Kogi. <clears throat> well, we are fundraising, and um, we are continuing our works with them. We have we created what we call the Elders Project, and we have. Um, a non-for-profit Earth Action is working with us, collecting the funds for us. So they're um, non-for-profit, and um, we are definitely uh, collecting funds because we've already been asked to help them uh, with another project. But we want to get through this first, and uh, we basically will keep in relationship with them and do whatever we can. Um, and so Earth Action is the is the is the organization and it's um if you want to send or anyone wants to send a donation any amount uh, would help and the the donation should be made payable to the elders project and send it to earth action attention the elders project p.o box 63 amherst massachusetts 01004 and Amherst is spelled A M H E R S T. Amherst. Okay, and we'll have that on our website as well. Now I have um, just one last question. You've, you've hung on an extra half hour, and I want to thank you for that. But uh, the the story that you told me the other day of the two blonde men coming into your oh. gallery. <laughs> um, can you tell yeah. that, and then I'll, and then I'll, I'll I'll cap it with a moral to the story. Okay, you have a moral. Oh boy, I want yes, to hear. You do. Okay, well, this was quite a few years ago, and uh, I had a gallery then, and I was uh, with a friend, and we were talking, having a conversation. She was a few feet away from me, and I was sitting on a low chair, um, and as we were talking, suddenly this man appeared next to me. It's sort of, I've been been trying to remember more details of this uh, since you and I talked about this, Um, and he was a very tall, blonde man, very muscular and um, he bent over to reach me, reach down to me, and in his, his hands he was holding a black box, a very black box. There were no seams. I noticed there were no seams, and I was looking at it because it was very close to me. And, and he said, it's time now. And as he said, it's time now, this little, like a hidden doorway uh, opened up in the top of the box. And within the box, inside, there were some flowing gears. I and mean, I don't know, I, it's hard to describe. It was, they were moving back and forth, back and forth, and, and some kind of a, a mechanism. And I looked, and I sat back, and I held my hands up, and I said, no, no, no. And with that, he stood up, and he looked toward the door. And I looked toward the door to see what he was looking at, and there was another man standing in the doorway that was pretty much identical to him. They were both dressed alike. They had black pants on, black shoes. They had these ill-fitting shirts on, and again, tall, blonde, very muscular. And the man at the door kind of moved his head as if to say, come, you know, let's go. And the other guy just walked out. 
And I sat there for a second, and my friend was standing there a few feet away from me, standing there, and I said, aliens. And she said, what? And I said, aliens. And she said, what? And I said, you didn't see, you didn't see those two men here? And she said, no, what two men? And that was pretty much it. <laughs> hmm. So what's your, what do you have to add to that? Well, the moral to the story, <laughs> the moral I'm going to make of it okay. uh, for this episode is that when you tell a story like that on a show like this, we'll get people on our message board who will be like, wow, that's amazing, and they'll talk about it and all that. But to talk about elements and, and um, some of the more naturalistic stuff, people go, wow, that's that's new age. I can't. That doesn't resonate with me, and it, it just <laughs> right. it's, it's really strange to me that some things are unacceptable and some other things aren't, and they're both so completely quote unquote abnormal that that how do you how do you choose one over the other? Mm-hmm. And uh, so I just want people to really pay attention to how they think and process right. and prejudice themselves mm-hmm. against information that they hear. I just think that that's important. Well, can I say what, what I think the moral of that story is? Yeah. Don't take boxes of gears from large, blonde, muscular men. <laughs> yeah, well, we learned that in World War II. And I, right. <laughs> I, I be, yeah, I'd be curious to know if any of your listeners uh, have had a, a similar experience or know anything about a black, seamless box or, you know, these blonde... I know other people have had experiences with tall, blonde, muscular men, but... I don't know, again, I didn't know anything about these, but somehow the words alien came out of my mouth, and I, I, it's strange, I don't know. So I'm curious, I'd be curious. I, I'm still, I guess it's been years, but I haven't thought about this since you and I had talked about it, Jeremy, and so I'm sort of like rethinking and trying to draw out more of a sense of what this was or, or what, you know, what was going on there with that. So. Right, or why you reacted that way and said no. And specifically why I reacted that way, because that's not really my nature, but it was a very strong reaction, and uh, and it was, I felt, and I think my friend was sort of in, she was sort of like in a in a limbo zone. I mean, she had, she was just totally just standing there, like, not even present, and she had no idea, and we were only a few feet away from her. Mm-hmm. So that was something was definitely. And you mentioned also about uh, time, and I said, well, you know, I didn't really, I didn't pay attention uh, to that, but I'm trying to reconstruct the situation in my mind. And and as you brought that up to me, now I'm kind of remembering that there could have been missing time because of the way. Um, the way he was when I said no, and suddenly, I mean, he was there with the box, and then I sat back, but he was already standing up, but the box was, when I said no, the box was in front of me. You know what I'm saying? Right, yeah, he was, yeah, sort of <clears throat> jumped in place. Uh, yeah, if I could, Barbara, if I can say that, um, I would say around about <clears throat> 1998 or 99, I got a call from a woman who was a waitress in an all-night diner, yeah. And uh, her story in summary was that she was waiting tables one night and it was a busy night. And uh, and this is not too awfully far from where I grew up. Uh, I was well familiar with the diner. And um, she was waiting tables, very busy night, lots of noise, lots of chatter and people. And she said all of a sudden it was like someone had flicked a switch and... Uh, the diner inside was silent and she said that there was a man behind her uh in a dark business suit uh who was blonde uh he was somewhat pale but not horribly pale not sickly pale uh but but i guess she, he was pale enough for her to mention it to me as part of his characteristic mm-hmm. uh there was another man at the door and he was holding a black box oh really uh, yeah the man behind her uh, said, come with us. She wouldn't. Uh, she, she then began shaking every one of her customers at her table uh, to no avail. And um, huh. the other one at the door happened to say something to the effect of, and don't quote me on this because I'm not sure because these notes are long gone, uh, something to the effect of, we're out of time. And they left uh, without her going with them. <laughs> wow. Uh, so she felt that she had averted something going uh-huh. on. 
Interesting. Well, he had said to me, it's time now, and then I couldn't, I didn't hear what he, what, because I was suddenly looking at the years or this black box opening up, but that was about 10 years ago. Right. I mean, you do know the black box is a common thing in experience or, you know, uh, accounts. I, I mean, I'm, okay. I'm, you, that is not uncommon. I mean, I've, I've got a lot of stories over the years about people being given black boxes and experiences and then not knowing where they put them, only that they'll know when it's time. That's why when Jeremy was telling me that story, it kind of clicked with me that, you know, a lot of people relate the black box and knowing when it's time or it's time or you'll know what to do with the black box when it's time, you'll know where you hit it when it's time, that sort of thing. So, well, that's interesting you're saying this about time because I received messages quite a few years ago about, and I kept hearing, now is the time. Uh-huh. Now is the time. It was like, okay. <laughs> but that's <laughs> when I started doing some very shift, my shifting in my life and doing certain works that I would never thought I'd be doing. Right, and that's but, likely what, what, it, what it was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm. And, oh, you know, now I'm remembering, you know, something, it's like, okay, so that was, that was around the time, speaking about time, when that per- those people came into the, and he said with the black box, that was not long after that was when I changed my whole life and really, really put my two feet on my spiritual work path. Uh-huh. That's yeah. when that happened. Because yeah. at that point in time, I was like in two different worlds. I was not completely and fully doing the work I'm doing now. Right, right. So that's, that's an interesting thing. Interesting. Thing. Very yeah. interesting. I'm going to look at that a little bit more. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for coming Great. on the show, and um, we'll have, have to have you back on. Uh, j- just <laughs> for my own clarification, you did say at some point that you had spirit guides who have left you, because I don't think I've ever heard <laughs> that before. Yes. Yes, I said that. <laughs> you were abandoned by spirit guides. I was abandoned by <laughs> those guides who just dumped me after all these years. You know? Yeah, later. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're out of here. She's a hopeless case. Well, it's so funny because I was talking to a woman just yesterday who called me about this very thing because she was gui- somebody guided her to talk to me. And and she, of course, immediately went to the whole thought of, okay, did I do something bad? Did I do something wrong? And I said, okay. I've been there. I understand that we would uh, automatically jump into that, but this has nothing to do with that at all. I've really come to the conclusion that it is what I mentioned before. That, and I look and look at everything clearly, and I can understand. Okay, I was brought to a certain point in my life. They were present with me all up to that point. Then, when I put my two feet on the ground, steady in the direction that you know that was meant to be. They kind of stepped back and said, okay, there you go. Hmm. Now you're on your own. Get strong. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And that's it. <clears throat> yeah. So actually they've been back. So, But there was that period, a long period of time where, uh, where they did, where I felt greatly abandoned. But I also spoke about Mother Teresa. I don't, we're getting on to other things here. I shouldn't go there. <laughs> Mother Teresa and her and her fifty years of being in the dark and her being abandoned. Did you know about the story of her? No. Well, you might want to look at, uh, look it up. I kind of found it very intriguing because at that time, I was in the throes of this abandonment situation where I felt like I was just left and the you know falling into you know they nobody was there. Not the usual connection, the usual guide, the usual message, the usual sense of their presence. And then I happened to read a little blurb about Mother Teresa, her hidden letters or her letters to her confessors over 50 years of what happened to her that had now become a book. She had said she wanted this this confidential information to be destroyed because it was, you know, very, very, very much a part of her, her uh, distress and her life, her loss. As soon as she was put on this pathway that she got, I mean, she was visited by Jesus, I guess, and had incredible visions, and she was guided to leave the the um, the uh, convent to go out into the slums of India to work with the poor, the people, and the lepers. And after finally getting permission from her superiors, 
as soon as she got permission and stepped onto that pathway, she felt abandoned by the guide, the Jesus, the being, the light, whatever it was. And for 50 years, with all that she did, she continued, but she was in such grief inside of herself and such loss and such, you know, terrible, terrible experience of being abandoned by her savior or the light, her guide. And she continued going and nobody knew it. And that's pretty powerful. Yeah. And it really talked talk to me a lot about faith and about what we have inside of ourselves and how she had to find her own way and continue the work that she was guided to do without that validation, you know? Hmm. So in a way, I mean, maybe this gets full circle back to Jeff's question of what can we do? You know, maybe uh, on one level, the best thing to do is to keep on keeping on um, with as much sort of compassion and and uh, right thinking as possible, you know, in, in spite yes. of not having a grand direction from somebody. Yes, exactly. I think that that's where we are being asked to go to further our capabilities. Mm. What we really know to be our own truth, we can't deny that. I think it's interesting when you say about, uh, I don't know, I, you know, immediately the mental picture that, that juts into my mind when we're talking about this kind of thing is almost like somebody in a, in a huge mansion representing the world um, and coming in and trying to turn on a light bulb. And once it goes on, they walk out of that room and go into another one that's dark and flip the light on in that, you know. Right. Uh, you know, and I guess, <laughs> I guess we think of the abandonment of, uh, uh, of whatever guide that we have, whatever it might be as, as some kind of leaving, but maybe that's, that's the point where, you know, you're on, <laughs> exactly. get the hell out on the stage now. <laughs> exactly. You know? Now yeah. that's right. I felt like, I felt like a child being pushed out onto the big world all by myself, but I had to find Within my own self, I had to find that and grope for it pretty much, really, really grope for it through that angst and fear and confusion. I had to grope for my own deep truth that I know to be, that I cannot deny. And there's your growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Interesting. Exactly. Well, now that we... You guys are great. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. <laughs> now that we've come upon two hours, you've avoided the after chat, <laughs> uh, where we would naturally skewer everything that you've said. No, we've I'm just had no commercials. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Right. I know. Time for water. Who the hell would have? Thank you again. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Okay. Take All care. Right. Take care. Bye.